We're back. Another edition of Kevin's Corner. I guess uh, week two of free agency. Now we're starting to get into wind down a little bit. League meetings start on Sunday, Eddie. So we'll have a little bit of that to recap next week. Owners meetings down in Orlando. And then, boy, we're just a little over a month away from the draft, I would assume. Colts will have their offseason program start you know, sometime in mid-April. So, again, like the final week or two of March – Early April can kind of get quiet, but again, you still have a little bit of league meeting stuff. You get in that offseason program, so still some news items to get to. Uh, we'll focus on free agency. A lot of Legarius Sneed discussion today on the pod and get to Twitter questions as well. Eddie Garrison, my bracket is in my bag. I'm pulling it out right now. I've got a 15 seed in South Dakota State winning. Really? I've got a 14 seed in Oakland in the Sweet 16. Are you sure this isn't Rosie's bracket? I've got Vermont as a 13. I've got a couple 12s. McNeese in the Sweet 16. I've got Grand Canyon winning a game. I've got Auburn, Alabama. No, excuse me. Auburn, Arizona, Houston, Purdue. Purdue over Arizona to win it all. Thoughts? Uh, uh, you say Purdue over Arizona? I want a rematch of that game at Gamebridge. We were, we were too preoccupied with Colts and... What, Steelers that day? Wasn't that the same exact tip time or kickoff time as Purdue, Arizona? I can't remember because there was like Colts were playing that day, Pacers were playing that day. Yeah, and IU had a game, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Earlier, so a but, lot there. You want to give out your final four? Uh, if I'm being honest, I was waiting for all the playing games to be done before I fully Ooh, did a bracket. look at you. Because uh, I needed to see how bad Virginia either won or lost last night, and I think I'm going to take Colorado State. Uh, in their first round game, because I was impressed with their defense, and no. I mean their best player just sat back and said, "Hey guys, I'm just gonna let you do it all." But I should warn you: Did you notice their opponent and their inability to score the basketball? I did. I did notice that, but gosh, Virginia, that makes your eyes bleed. All right, should we hop in? Yeah, happy first weekend of March Madness, by the way. Yes, happy weekend of first ma- Mar- uh, first week of March Madness, certainly. Um, as we sit here right now, Eddie, on Wednesday morning, Julian Blackman's it. I mean, I cannot recall a week into the new league year the Colts have having this much activity this early. And I just mean it by their own re-signings or guys have, that have departed. I think the four that have departed are Gardner Minshew, Zach Moss, Isaiah McKenzie to the Giants, Jake Martin to the Bears, and then, of course, a ton of in-house moves. I believe the only two we've yet to talk about are the two from yesterday. That would be Tuesday. Taven Bryant and Danny Pinter. Um, Bryant was a guy that I had in the red category. I think he's the only re-signing that I had in that red category. Um, I can fully acknowledge I thought the Colts played him out of position last year with Grover Stewart's injury uh, suspension. They asked him to play that nose tackle. It did not go well at all. I think he's a fine depth three technique rotation guy behind Buckner. Honestly, in an ideal world, Adetamiwa Adabare would fill that role. You know, that's, I mean, you would hope your fourth round pick in year two could be a rotational backup guy. And, you know, if you look at their D line right now, I mean, hell, they, they've got a ton of dudes in there. Um, maybe you could argue about the high-end quality of some of them, but certainly from a depth standpoint, I mean, they still got Eric Johnson and Dio Dengbo can slide inside in a pinch, and Taekwon Lewis has played inside before. and So they've got a lot there. Um, I don't think it's by any means locked into a roster spot for Taven Bryan, but we'll see how he operates during training camp. Former first-round pick, Taven Bryan of the Jags. Does that sound right? Mm-hmm. Jacksonville took him. I believe he's a Florida product if I'm not mistaken Danny Pinter back in a one-year deal I've said this throughout I had Pinter in the yellow category uh, Jack Muhort Tyquan Lewis him. former draft pick he's had a nice moment or two might as well one-year deal prove it off the season ending injury you know broke that ankle in uh, Philly in that preseason finale um, so yeah I'm fine with that Wesley French still under contract you know I do think from a center of the future standpoint, Eddie. I wouldn't mind seeing a middle-ish round draft pick go to a center here coming up in April. Uh, Kelly's in a contract year next year. Does that sound right? Sounds about right, yeah. You know, he'd be getting up there in age. uh, And then, you know, again, French and and Pinter, you still have, I believe both will be in contract years next year. So that's kind of how I look at center there. So 
again, um, nothing earth shattering by any means. And, um, you know, with Julian Blackman being the one guy, he was the one I just always kind of looked at as a coin flip of, it's a reminder of free agency could be a two-way street. You know, I think that the injury history and how the safety position looks, because there's still, I mean, as we sit here Wednesday morning, there's still some notable safeties. Oh, yeah. And there's even still a couple notable corners. Um, certainly the Colts, in my opinion, need to dive into both of those positions from a veteran standpoint. Um, you know, I think you get into a debate a lot of times, and I try to bring it to light of, would you address this need more draft-wise? Would you address this need more free agency-wise? I think those are two totally different things. Mm-hmm. And the secondary is just filled with so much inexperience that I think it's both of those positions should get free agency attention. I mean, you drafted three corners last year, and I get that you know one is no longer here, but um, I think free agency attention first there is needed. You know, obviously we've seen Blackman visit the Bills. We saw Mike Edwards visit here, and I believe is now visiting Buffalo. So you know, clearly the Colts are doing their. Homework on the safety market, and then Blackman is doing his homework on other teams around the league. So, um, overall, free agency thoughts will probably play out here when we get into Legarius Sneed discussion. But anything for you, Eddie, on Pinter, Brian, or Julian Blackman? Uh, you were correct about Taven Bryan, 29th overall pick, the 2018 draft by Jacksonville out of Florida. He went somewhere else. He go to Cleveland. Was that his other NFL stop? Um. Yes, he was in Cleveland for one season in yeah. 22. He's got over 30 starts, so um, or had over 30 starts in those other spots. So, yeah. Again, I'm not. I mean, I don't. He doesn't need to be playing a significant amount in an ideal world. Honestly, in an ideal world, he gets cut. Mm-hmm. If you really want to be honest, you know, Grover Stewart starter. His backup should be Raekwon Davis. The first Correct. Buckner starter. His backup should be Adabare. Eric Johnson would probably be the other guy as a fifth-round pick from a few years ago that you'd like to be providing depth at defensive tackle. Five defensive tackles? That's probably enough. Five defensive ends? That's ten. Yeah. And if you want to count your five defensive ends right now, Ebukam, Pei, Dayo Adangbo, Taekwon Lewis, Isaiah Land. I could totally be missing somebody. Uh, who's the kid they drafted last year? Titus Leo, mm-hmm. you know, six round pick. Jannard Avery, they resigned. So again, you've got now that's seven. Having saying all of those names and numbers, I still will hammer home elite edge rusher at fifteen. That is still to me the path that must be explored if the opportunity presents itself come late April. But right now, from a body standpoint, you got a whole lot there. Um, so that'll be a group, as always, really in the Ballard era. It'll be interesting to see play out. Uh, we had Mike Chappell on our show, Corian Company, uh, noon to three Eastern, Monday through Friday, um, on Monday, and he, we were asking him about Julian Blackman, and he kind of suggested that he thinks Blackman expected his market to be more robust and to be able to secure a bigger contract um, than what he expected, and perhaps that's why he's been on the market so long. And I thought that was a little interesting because you would think a guy that's been hampered by injuries the majority of his career thus far would kind of have an understanding that he wouldn't be able to secure the contract probably that he desires uh, just because he struggled to finish seasons. Yeah, the injury history can't be ignored. And again, we're talking ACLs and Achilles. It's not like we're talking, you know, whatever an ankle knocks him out for a month. Um, I really, really like him a lot. I do too. I think our listeners know that. But at the same time, I can also sit there and say, boy, three years, if you give him a three-year deal and all of a sudden one of those injuries pop up again, that's a huge, huge problem that you have. And, you know, safety is one of those positions, Eddie. You could find some dudes that, like, go 10 years in the league and miss three games. Yeah. I mean, safety is kind of a durable position when you look at it. So I'll be curious to see how that plays out. Uh, But, I mean, hell, you were in scramble mode without him late last year. Remember, you benched Rodney Thomas at the end of last season, too. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, Blackman was out due to injury, and then you bench Thomas. Your starters in the last two games were Nick Cross and Ronnie Harrison Jr. The converted linebacker safety, linebacker safety, line. You know, I mean, it's wild to kind of think about it and look back on that. Uh, anything else on your end? I don't have anything else. No. Let's get into the Legarius Steed stuff. Um, and when you say stuff, what do you mean by stuff? Well, I. <laughs> 
Because part of me wonders if everyone knows the yeah, yeah, full yeah. backstory. Yeah, you know, There's no point in ignoring the elephant in the room. You know, Saturday was a very awkward day on Colts Twitter. You had very conflicting reports and what was being reported with the Snead news and not. I think the breaking news game is one of the most dangerous games to try and play as a reporter. Uh, I've thought about that with my own brand here over the last few years and have just thought, you know what? That's a slippery game. Uh, it can be ugly. People can flat out lie to you <laughs> to try and get their message out, and you look awful in the end of it. So it's a game that I just choose to kind of sit out, to be totally honest. I'm not a big breaking news guy. I, I love to collect and have conversations like that, but then just kind of use it for context whenever news does eventually break and mm-hmm. just tr- tr- provide a little bit more clarity on that. And I think how you saw it play out on Saturday with Destin Adams and Stephen Holder is a bit of that. And, you know, the definition of a source can get really, really murky and all of that. So um, right now, as we sit here on Wednesday morning, it sounds like the Colts. And if you look at their cap space and how they've operated in past off seasons, they typically would hold off on anything big given their cap space right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, a lot of other NFL teams would look at the cap space and say, no, 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 you can still do something with that. And you could restructure a Buckner. You could restructure an Elson. You could cut Moali. You know, you could find ways to contractually make a type of splash with Snead work. Because right now they have like 10, 15 million in cap space, right? I think if you allocate like the rookie pool for the draft picks, yes, somewhere around that. Um, and this gets into kind of the age old question of Jim Mercer and Chris Boward and the handling of the cap and the handling of free agency in general and trying to make it work. Um, you know, I guess let's focus on Sneed as a player. Um, it would be a big swing at a premium position. That is how I kind of view the luxurious Sneed move. It'd be a big swing in that there is some risk in it. But again, it's at a premium position. And it's at a position, Eddie, that when is the last time the Colts had an outside cornerback play multiple years for them that you were confident in? Vontae Davis? Even still, you weren't... You're going back a decade ago. Vontae Davis, in my opinion, was the best player on the Colts football team during that 2014 run to the AFC title game. Yeah, I thought he was incredible. The game at Denver, he was incredible. Um... I would agree with you. You know, Xavier Rhodes and Stephon Gilmore had really nice individual single seasons. I think Pierre Desir had a nice year in there. But again, the multi-year, you just haven't gotten of like, oh, that's a top, whatever, let's say a top 15 outside corner in the league. Like, let's just call him, you know, whatever. Or uh, even, you could probably even go a little bit longer on the list than that. And the root of this does stem from Quincy Wilson never sniffing a second contract. Mm Mm-hmm. And Rock you seen, well, I don't think Rock was a bust. He never got to a second contract. And the trade you made for Ngakwe, it never really turned into like the return wasn't what I would equate to if Rock was a hit and he got to your second contract, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. You know, Ngakwe was one year and then gone. So um, that's where the corner issues kind of stem from. And, you know, if you hear Chris Ballard talk about Juju Brents, it's a lot of like he's got to stay healthy. And then the description of Juju Brents kind of stops. So, like, I don't hear just a ton of, like, massive optimism Mm -hmm. in that voice. Uh, Now, I think Jalen Jones played really, really good football for a seventh-round pick last year, and I'm eager to see his growth and development. But um, what intrigues me about Snead is you are in a position as a franchise right now where you can take big swings, and if you whiff, the whiff is still with a couple of outs to play with that inning. Mm-hmm. It's not the whiff with two outs and the bases loaded in the bottom of the ninth. Great analogy with the MLB season starting this morning. Shout out to the Padres blowing it, right? And the Dodgers winning the opener, yep. if, I, if I saw that correctly. Yep. Um, I, I love the baseball analogies. I think I like them more than the golf analogies, honestly. Um, the Master, I do too. Masters, by the way, less than a month away, Eddie. That's kind of how I view the rookie contract with Richardson. It is the opportunity to take swings and the miss not be as severe. And that's where I think, as we sit here right now, and again, it's March 20th, but let's just play out the hypothetical that nothing substantial happens again. Or I should say happens at all. Like, 
this is where I view the offseason as a bit of a missed opportunity. And the window just now falls a little bit more. You're in that old home where the window just, just, it just falls as soon as you open it. That's where I'm at with the missed opportunity. Um, so, you know, third round pick, second round pick, whatever it would have been, 20 million. Again, that's a big swing. I don't want to lose sight of that. I mean, that's a bit, I mean, it's a double whammy swing. And if you want to compare it to Buckner from 2020, you know, Buckner was an unquestioned all pro. Mm-hmm. Before that trade happened, I mean, hell, he was arguably the best player in the Super Bowl. If you look at Snead, nothing yet all pro or pro bowl on the resume. You could point to a lot of statistics last year that would indicate he played at that level, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at, I think the completion percentage was just over 50 allowed. I think the passer rating was just over 50 allowed. Those are great numbers. Uh, By all accounts, he excels in zone coverage. That fits kind of the Colts mold. I think that's important to keep an eye on as well. Um, you know, didn't allow a touchdown. Got his hand on a lot of balls. I think he had 14 passes defensed. I want to say it was double digits the year prior. So all of those things check. I know he played through a bit of a knee injury. Maybe there's some concern there um, about that long term. But again, it's the big swing at the premium position, and I think that is what is enticing to me about it. And also, you would get to the point of the draft. Let's just play out the a third round pick and here's the money etc cetera, etc cetera. you know you could theoretically recoup that by trading back in round one mm-hmm. you're getting an additional pick and i think what it would do even if you didn't trade back in round one i would like to see edge rusher and pass catcher be the first two selections but again it would eliminate corner need where like i almost feel like right now if you went into the draft tomorrow Boy, do you feel like you got to force a secondary need early? Yeah, yeah. That and right now, if you look at mock drafts, I mean that that's a consensus around. You know, everybody's got the Toledo kid going at fifteen there. So, you know, this sort of move would still allow you to be patient with a little bit of your young corners. Um, but again, if you want to nitpick it, it's not as safe as the Buckner thing. Granted, you give up what thirteen overall for Buckner, um, and it's a lot to give up for a twenty-seven-year-old corner. If you view the injury concerns there, you know, corners get to 30 pretty quick. And Rhodes and Vontae Davis would be probably golden examples of that. So that's probably where some of your paws would come into play here at this. But I would just say overall, Eddie, and this necessarily isn't in the Sneed camp. And it's why in February, you and I kind of had these debates, and I, I forget we had a great Twitter question about it. And you know, hell, it's a question I threw to Ballard at the end of the year. But it's this fascinating predicament the Colts were in entering this offseason. You've got this golden, unique, foreign opportunity of building with a rookie contract quarterback. Mm-hmm. Yet you have the most notable in-house free agent list you've had in the Ballard era, and you know how he treats homegrown, homegrown talent. And, you know, it's why I said to Ballard at the season eight presser, I go, is there a part of you that's just like, you've re signed the top four guys and that's all you do? And he didn't want to go down that path. And then he also several times pointed out in that season ending presser, Eddie, he pointed out the rookie contract and how the Richardson's deal allows you to do some things differently. So, you know, and I think this falls in line with a lot of Stephen Holder's reporting of like, I think initially there was some whatever, Daniil Hunter, Legereus Sneed, thought. But then, like, it feels like as soon as that stuff started to become a long shot, they pivoted and were like, we're re-signing everybody. Yeah. And I, was there, like, a hesitancy to say, hey, let's let Grover walk, still re-sign the other two, go out there, find use that money somewhere else of significance, and then, boom, maybe you're getting, like, a C-plus level defensive tackle to make up for Grover's loss. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, hell, I guess Ra- Ra- Raquan Davis could could start if you really viewed it in that light playing out there. Um, you know, I think we have, and I don't want to speak for all of our listeners, but there are definitely some math nerds out there that have reached out to me before about it. I cannot stress this enough for those that aren't in the math nerd category. The NFL and the ability to build with a rookie contract quarterback is like the most golden of an opportunity as you're going to get. Mm -hmm. To do things differently, to try to swing at a few pitches you wouldn't normally swing at. 
Um, all of that is there in kind of a three-year window. And, and right now is year one of, of Richardson. And as I view it on March 20th, and again, we'll see how the rest of the offseason plays out, but for the most part, you'd think the bulk of the veteran additions have come and gone. You're putting a lot of pressure on the kids' plate. Oh, yeah. And I am an above and beyond supporter of the rookie quarterback. Walk into the kitchen and put 57 ingredients in there, and if he only uses 22 of them for the dish, who cares? At least you gave him more than you need. And that's kind of how I view that. And, you know, you can make the argument right now in terms of the AFC South that there's a better pass catching group in Houston. There's a better pass catching group in Jacksonville. Tennessee, you could probably debate a little bit more. Um, and again, you know, CJ Stroud and Trevor Lawrence and, and those examples, they've accomplished a whole lot more in the NFL than obviously Richardson has have. So um, I'm, I'm optimistic about Anthony Richardson moving forward. I, I am. But at the same time, I'm not overly optimistic about the levels of support you've given them. And really, you can make the case both sides of the ball right now. Yeah. Just with, I mean, right now, the defense is largely a run it back unit. Mm -hmm. We'll see how the Blackman things plays out. We'll see where the other additions are in the secondary. You know, certainly in the front seven, it's pretty much all run it back with Raekwon Davis being the only newcomer there. It's just not the avenue that I would have explored. Um, I would have taken a little bit more of a risk. And, you know, you still have other off seasons to swing at those pitches to continue that baseball analogy. Um, but still, in the very fragile years of your young quarterback, where, yes, at some point, Richardson's got to cover up mistakes. Mm-hmm. But you're not there yet, and you're not there financially if you just want to play the math game. I think it's a missed opportunity. Do you think... I was thinking about this last week because you were on with uh, Jimmy Cook and Jake Query, and Jimmy asked you the question about if it was a missed opportunity with the Richardson contract. I sat there in the moment, you know, I was like, you know what? It's like the first year of this, but at the same time, you would like to see them add just or take a swing just at one position, and then next year do the same thing, whether that's on offense or on defense. And then that third year, in that third offseason, and going into that fourth year, You've got to make the decision on the fifth year contract, uh, fifth year option. So, and right. more than likely, you're going to pick it up, barring uh, Richardson dealing with injuries. Sure. You know, each of the previous three seasons. So, then I'm like, yeah, I kind of agree with Kevin and Jimmy in, in that regard. But I don't know. It's so hard and fickle to think about because they were just one drop away from winning the AFC South. Definitely, and. I think the Colts are viewing that and like just thinking, assuming they'll be right there when, again, I look at other teams in the AFC South right now and I'm thinking, boy, I see some steps forward. I would say Houston, you know. We talk so much about, well, the Colts will be in a better injury situation next year. Well, I mean, you know, Tank Dell missing that season finale in Houston. I mean, if you want to talk about just that week leading into the game, Houston had a ton of injuries Yeah, in that specific week. And the schedule to me, undeniably, is going to be tougher next season as well. And it just, um, it seems like you're banking on hope and you're banking a lot on Richardson. And that's just to me, I want to alleviate some stress. I want to alleviate some of that pressure off of his plate, off of his shoulders there. And I don't think you're doing enough of that. And it's, you know, relatively status quo. So, you know, we'll see how all of that plays out. But um, again, right now, it looks like the big move window is kind of come and gone for the Colts. You ready for Twitter questions? I am. Only a few to get to. Randall is first. It's extremely irritating that they got Justin Fields for a conditional sixth round pick talking about the Pittsburgh Steelers. Seemed like a hell of an insurance policy. My original text was about a second rounder. Sweet Christ. I hope it doesn't come down to Joe Flacco. I hope Anthony Richardson balls out. But if he ends up injured again and we have to trot out big throw Joe, I'm going to be sad. Could have had a young, dynamic backup. Instead, we have a 38-year-old statue. We love 38-year-old statues in our quarterback room. Love them. If I can foresee that Fields is going to be uh, relegated to a backup role upon trade, why can't the Colts front office? This guy seems very passionate, by the way. Yeah, I appreciate it, Randall. Um, I, I would 
say this in regards to this sort of question. My tune to answering this is different than it was with Philip Rivers, Carson Wentz, or Matt Ryan. Like, what Pittsburgh is doing, I'm nodding my head at. Wilson is not a guarantee. It's He's vet, a ban- vet minimum for one year. Right. He's a Band-Aid. And they're looking at it and say, all right, let's see if we can put a little bit more quarterback stability around a team that frequently makes the playoffs despite mediocre quarterback play. And if not, let's have the high-end backup. And that, to me, checks. Now, here in Indy, it's not the same situation. Like, if you have serious Anthony Richardson doubt, then sure, go ahead and pursue Justin Fields. But when you draft a quarterback that high, I'm a big believer in that every move must be made to help him, help his development. You are committing to a multi-year development process when you draft a guy like, like, like that. And to me, Flacco furthers the development more than Fields. Fields still thinks he should start. Fields still thinks he should be a franchise quarterback. Right. Fields does not have 180 starts in the league. He doesn't have 16 postseason starts. He has not seen the dysfunction of the Jets and the consistency of the Ravens. Flacco, just off osmosis, will give Richardson some of that. He'll show him, hey, this is how we did it. This is how I like to, whatever, prep for a game, or this is what we do to attack those certain defenses, et cetera, et cetera. So, this is how you turn the lights out at the Super Bowl? <laughs> you could throw that in there. You know, again, Fields is kind of gunning for that spot. So, um, I understand where Randall's thought is coming from here. I do, but to me, I'm trying to eliminate like the distractions, and I think Fields would create more of that. Now, if Anthony Richardson turns into an absolute bust, sure, you're now kind of in scr- well, yeah, you are in scramble mode and finding that next franchise quarterback, but. The development of him is so precious and so fragile. I want to make sure that he feels comfortable with probably the person he is going to be with the most next season, outside of a coach, and that is your backup quarterback. And that's where I think Flacco makes a lot more sense than a guy like Fields. Um, I understand that there are some people that agree with this thought process, and that should be the route, and you should always find the high-end backup and all of that. And I think there comes a point in time where your starting quarterback is established enough you don't worry about that as much, mm-hmm. but I don't think at 21 years old is the time to do that. So I'm good with the approach the Colts are taking at backup quarterback. We had five questions in total, so four left. Colton says he's stumped on whether the Colts will draft a pass catcher in round one. He's all in for getting as much support around Anthony Richardson as possible, but the Colts also aren't in desperate need of a wide receiver one or a stud like Brock Bowers. I also think Josh Downs should showed a lot of promise last year as well. So would you draft one in the mid rounds or try to get Anthony Richardson all the help he needs and go round one? Well, <clears throat> I think if if you play out the Pierce and the Pittman Jr. contract situations, okay? Pierce is in what, year three of year four? Yes. Pittman Jr.'s got a three-year deal. Correct. If you just play out those contracts, you're going to need a guy for the back end of Richardson's rookie deal. And obviously Downs you know, fits that outside of the fifth-year team option. But like, you know, Pittman talks like a guy like, I'd like to be re-upped after two years. And, you know, I, there's a reason why he likes three years better than four to hit that accelerating wide-out market, to use his word. Um, at the age of 29. But if you were to tell me in 2029, 2028, Anthony Richardson is what, 25 years old, 26 years old at that point? Yeah. Who is his leading wideout? And if you said, here's Alec Pierce, here's Michael Pittman Jr., or here's the field, would you take the field? Or would you take Pierce or Pittman? Ooh. Probably take Pittman, because knowing Ballard, I freaking love Pitt, man. They'll they'll bring him back, and he'll be a Colt for life, probably. Yeah, and, and I could see where you're going with that, but like, it's not like a slam dunk, right? In my mind, like you still, I mean, hell, you could draft the wideout at 15, and he turns into being that number one guy, and Pitt you know, just kind of slides down to being more of that complement. So, um. It's just so hard to tell because, I mean, the entire roster is a free agent after 2027. 
Right. Well, or 2026. Yeah. Everybody getting those same length contracts. And, you know, and this is the debate, Colton, that gets into the draft itself. Ballard calls it, you know, super generational wide receiver draft or et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if he said generational, but whatever. He thinks it's very good. Do you then pounce on the high end talent or do you rely on the depth there? Yeah. That's the debate that you get into. And then, again, the scarcity at edge rusher. It sounds like corner, though, is relatively deep. So, um, I am not like a you have to take it at 15, but if you do, I mean, it's not like Pierce is here forever. It's not like Pittman Jr. is here forever. And Downs is in a very specific role as that slot guy. So I, I support for Anthony Richardson, direct player acquisition to aid that will get no complaints from me. Do you expect, or shouldn't say expect, what would you say percentage wise is uh, the Colts would trade up in the first round? I know it's probably like 1%. Yeah, that's probably too much. Right. Yeah. I mean, better chance, you know, whatever. St. Peter's wins it all. They but, were the first team I looked at on my bracket over here. <laughs> or how about Long Beach State? Didn't they fire their coach? You tell him he's leaving and then they won the conference tournament? Yes. One of the best stories right now in college basketball. But like, you've got, and I know I'm wishful thinking when I state this. There's like three or four teams within the top 11, 12 that are looking to move back. And you've got Minnesota, that's the team that is looking to move up. You've got Denver, a team that's looking to move up. If you have like three or four teams right there in that top seven, top eight that are just roster depleted and they just want more picks to have a, to bring in higher talent in a numerous amounts of talent, I don't know. There's just a, there's a possibility to me that I would want to pounce on in terms of trading up to try and get one of those top wide receivers. Sure. Yeah, and I and again a lot of that is, you know, board specific and you just kind of laid out how it could fall to where all of a sudden, you know, if it is quarterback centric, do you get the second or third wide out there at 7 or 8? Right. And um you know, I I think the difference there Eddie is that obviously is a huge swing. But that swing is not the financial like, if you swing in the draft, you're largely swinging with two outs in the bottom of the ninth. Mm-hmm. If you swing in free agency, the swing is more with zero outs in the bottom of the ninth. You still got guys behind you that can come up to the plate because if you miss financially, it comes off your books, whatever, rather early. You aren't paying Richardson big money, et cetera, et cetera. If you swing in the draft, that's kind of a multi year swing where if you miss, Theoretically, to get from 15 to 8, you're giving up what? A future first? A future second? I don't know exactly what that would look like, but it would be something. It would also depend on how far, how far up right, they go, right, too. Right. That that as well. Um, so I, I, I certainly hear you out on it, but who's the man making those calls? That's true. <laughs> I think we know the answer on that. Yeah. Uh, let's get back to the Twitter questions. Cameron would like to know if he's crazy or is Colt's math different? By the way, is, is he making Colt's math like girl math, like? It's own thing now. <laughs> you might Cameron should uh you know put a little patent on that. Yeah. Uh Cameron says teams seem to continually be in the top five every offseason, the Colts that is, for most cap space, but they resign their own players and then they're out of money. While other teams with lay last cap uh hands out contracts like they're candy. What am I missing? I think I've said this a lot on this show, but I will reiterate. The Colts do, compared to the other 32 NFL, 31 other NFL teams, the Colts are on more the frugal end of it. And and I hope frugal is the right word. I would just say that they're just not as big as the front load, the lingering cap hits, the restructurings, you know, pushing contracts deep into the future, that sort of stuff. It's just not their MO. They're not going to throw a lot of cash up front um, compared to some other teams. Mm -hmm. And and you could say probably the majority of the NFL. I would put the Colts, I guess, uh, I don't know, bottom quartile. Maybe not bottom quartile. Nice. um, I I would put them kind of in that range. So um, I guess in simplest terms, that is how – I would look at it. Again, Eddie, what what did you throw to me cap space wise for the Colts? What was that number that you threw out? Like 10, 15 million. Okay, 10, 15 million. Again, for 
a good majority of the NFL, they would view that as the chance to go out and make another splash. But the Colts just don't operate like that, you know, pretty consistently in the Ballard era, certainly. Um, And I think some of this is a bit ownership driven, but I also think there's a level of contentment and agreement (coughs) with the personnel department on top of that. So I don't know. I hope that explains it a bit. Yeah. Stephen Holder had this a couple days ago. That's where I got my number from. He said, uh, that many have asked him about the Colts remaining cap space. It's a bit fluid until all details of the new contracts are known. He says it's currently somewhere between 21 and 23 million. Now this was before, uh, the Taven Bryan and Danny Pinter contracts, but I can't imagine both of those are what a combined 4 million, maybe right. um, yeah. with no. Pinter being the bigger of the two emphasis on maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he says, however, another 9 million must be deducted for the incoming rookie class. So it could be as little as 12 to 13 million in all reality. Yeah. That seems to check out. And again, that to the average person would say you can spend it. Especially because I, I don't I don't know. I I could try to pull up like who are the Colts free agents next year. What what, what do you got? Buckner, I guess Kelly. Um who am I missing? Is Braden Smith? Uh I, yes. Is he already? For some reason I thought he'd be Maybe a little bit further down the road. Gosh, I can't believe I'm already thinking about this. <laughs> We haven't even had the draft yet, Kevin. I know, but I get. I mean, these are you know these are the questions that that the Colts themselves ask in it. Uh, okay, twenty twenty five. Buckner, Kelly. I mean, hell, that's it. Quitty pay. Yeah, but again, I mean, you got the fifth year team option. I guess if you want to delay that a little bit longer, Dio, EJ Speed, Moali Cox. Man, Moali Cox be thirty two. Joe yeah, Flacco, can't Plus forget about I'm that one. I mean, I guess if Dallas Flowers were to have a great year coming off the Achilles there. Not a lot is what I'm getting at compared to what you had this year. Um, Branson? Yeah. Has Max started to uh, write and type in sentences yet? Max Bowen? Yes. Uh, no. Okay, so this is in front of him. Dic- his dictionary is about 32 words. Okay, so, I mean, that's much bigger than mine. Um, so, Max is up next and not Max Bowen. Oh. If the Colts were able to pull off a trade for Legereus Sneed, they would probably have to give up their second round pick. If this happened, do you think that would make trading back from 15 more likely? We all know Chris Ballard loves them picks. Also, since you were talking about doppelgangers on the last pod, I have always thought you looked like Justin Thomas. <laughs> Thanks for keeping us informed and entertained during the off season. Oh my gosh. You think it was my burner that sent that in? Is that I'd who cut, you wish you looked like? I'd cut off maybe just like this part of the pinky. I'm going like a third of the way down. You're going to the last knuckle? Yeah. To swing the golf club like Justin Thomas. I mean, he's a good-looking dude. I, I, I'd i I'd probably rather be a little, maybe my height, if I could nitpick a little bit. Maybe I can't get too greedy with that. But uh, granted, Justin Thomas at a size still hits the golf ball about 70 yards further than I do. So um, that would be nice here. Who's your early Masters pick? Really? We're going there? Yeah. Did you not watch the Players' Championship this no. past weekend? No. I love how bled right into Selection Sunday. That made for an awkward moment there for the Bowen family. Um, yeah, I, I think if you were to if you were to do the Sneed trade, I think in all likelihood you'd try to recoup it. Well, I, what was the report? Like a third rounder and then a fifth third next and year? fifth of something yeah. like that. Um, so yeah, if you traded back from what fifteen to twenty three. I think you'd get a third rounder or something like that. I think that would be the goal there. I'm still trying to figure out who you want me to pick for the Masters. No, just say Scotty Scheffler and move on. I don't want to do that. That's the easy way out. Sergio, Mickelson, okay. Nick Dunlop, Tiger. Let me get to this last Twitter question from Matt, and then I'll give you my prediction, I guess. Come on, uh, pins and needles. Uh, <laughs> Uh, This was sent early into free agency because Matt's question states, three days into free agency, can you rank how the AFC uh, South teams have done? Obviously, time will tell, but it seems like the Jaguars, Texans, and Titans have added major upgrades. The Colts have re-signed in-house players, a backup defensive tackle, and Joe Flacco. Can't really say the Colts have improved any. What are your thoughts? P.S. I think the Texans have improved their team the most in free agency. 
Thanks for the pod, listener from Day Numero Uno. Matt, thank you. A genuine thank you. Is that your brother? To say the least. I know. Gosh, it does sound like a lot of family here. So we got a Max and a Matt. Round out the Twitter question. I do have a brother-in-law named Matt. Uh, shout out to Matt Lovers. Um, what did the Texans do? Mixon, Singletary gone, Joe Mixon in. Daniil Hunter for Jonathan Gennard. And then Danico Autry. Am I missing anything? Big from the Texans. You mentioned Mixon, right? Yeah, Mixon for Singletary. Yeah. If you want to swap that Brought out. back Noah Brown. Brought back Dalton Schultz. Yeah, Schultz is the re-sign. Yeah, I, I, I like what Houston's done. Um, And they still got a first-rounder, right? I know they trade up for Will Anderson. And they have Cleveland, I think Cleveland's, right, from Watson? Yep. I think they still got that. So, um, I, I, I like what you say. You know, in a way, I kind of like what Jacksonville did. I mean, I know losing Ridley, but I think Gabe. I mean, hell, Gabe Davis has made some big time plays in the playoffs. And, um, you know, if you look at Jacksonville's season, you know when it went to hell. I mean, yeah, Lawrence got a little banged up, but when when Christian Kirk was lost, mm-hmm. it really went to hell. I mean, if you look at the on field Kirk numbers versus off field, that tells you the whole story about Jacksonville's season. And, and you know, I think keeping Josh Allen was important for them as well. Um, yeah, I, I view. When do they start paying Lawrence? Um, well, he's still on his rookie contract, right? So they're not. I mean, they're not there yet. I mean, they're they're nearing. They that. have well, the, he's extension eligible now, but they. So he could be uh, look at it next or this summer. Probably start that on the maybe. books coming up next year. What I'm getting at, Eddie, is yeah. I mean, they're taking advantage of the back end of that window. You know, I talk about Richardson right now on the front end of that window, like Richardson, like Stroud, and then you look at Jacksonville. They're kind of on the back end, and you know, I. I I do like what they've done and kind of offsetting the loss of Ridley still, and um, but yeah, Houston again. I mean, uh, you know, Tank Dell to me. I mean, I know the Colts didn't really see him this year because there was that three month gap in the games and he really wasn't anything in week two, and then it wasn't certainly where he was in whatever that November December stretch. So, um, yeah, I, I right now I just think. I mean, wh- what are you banking on right now? You're banking on Richardson, Braden Smith staying healthy, Alec Pierce to take a stride with Richardson. Your O line to have no 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 real setbacks. You know your O line certainly took a step forward. You know Quiddy to take a jump off the edge. Um, getting another and I guess internal development from your young DBs. I was gonna say getting another. Um, you know. Good season out of Samson Epicom and right, right, right. And I guess the I, what I was going with there is like, what are the negatives from last season that you're thinking are going to be positives? Oh yeah, or your unknowns, I should say, or a you defensive know, you, playmaker that forces sure. Turnovers. I mean, again, is that again is that Quiddy emerging? Is that a young you know, guy in the secondary? So when I look at that list, I'm like, damn, that's kind of a lot. And, and important pieces, right? And I think we fall into the trap too, Eddie, of like we just assume everything else that was good or healthy last season will be good and healthy again. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just not how the NFL operates, right? So that's where I have a little nervous energy and banking on that. And then again, for the um- umpteenth time in a row, and I know we'll get a schedule release in a little over a month. It'll remind all of us. I just think the schedule's better. Oh yeah, and tougher, and the quarterbacks especially on that end. So, again, as we record this late Wednesday morning, Julian Blackman is the one still out there. We'll see how the rest of free agency plays out with safety and corner, especially as we start to inch closer to the draft. He is Eddie Garrison. I'm Kevin Bowen. Your master's pick is who? I'm going to go with uh, Cameron Smith. Live die hard over there. Eddie Garrison going with the mop. Of Cameron Smith's hair. I do love watching Cameron Smith play golf. Unfortunately, he's in the live tour, and I just don't watch that. Um, Everybody have a great week. Great weekend. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to Kevin's Corner.